or continue. So welcome, Sue, and please uh, go ahead. Hi, good morning, and uh, thank you for that lovely welcome. So looking at my uh, lead screen here, I see an assembly line. I see everything that is the same. And so some people would have you believe that I just follow the algorithm, right? Well, I'm going to take you through a little bit of, uh, of the literature and look at maybe some deviation from those algorithms. So if you're looking for a summary of the 2020 ACLS guidelines, we have it on our NB Heart Center YouTube channel. So feel free to go and uh, explore those. So a little bit about resuscitation. So the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation revises and looks at the science in, um, in a very comprehensive way every five years. And then they offer a yearly update. So basically what they do is they look at the science and they compile the science. And then it is up to the six global councils to kind of um, standardize them and so we follow the American Heart Association. So Heart and Stroke puts their stamp of approval, but our guidelines are very Americanized. And so you'll notice that when everything talks about uh, go to a PCI capable facility. Well, in the US, that's much easier than in Canada. So we have to take into account the ruralness of Canada. And so Heart and Stroke does a great job of kind of localizing our practices and standards. So every five years, the latest update was in 2020. So I think simplicity is key. And if you've ever taken an ACLS course, you're going to notice how simplified it has come over the past 30 to 40 years. My first ACLS course, there was over 40 cardiac meds that I had to know the dose of, the range of, and now there's very few. So I really like this little video, uh, kind of makes me laugh. Hopefully it projects okay. And so it is all about simplicity. And uh, you'll notice that in an ACLS course that it is much more simplified. So much of the data that we have in our guidelines is based on out of hospital cardiac arrest. And so one wonders, is that transferable to the in-house population? And so this was published in Resuscitation in January 2021, basically took about 12,000 patients, so 8,800 out of hospital cardiac arrest and around 3,500 in-house. And it found significant similarity in their dem demographics and their comorbidities. And they identified that in hospital cardiac arrest patients should actually have a better outcome because they're often witnessed and you have healthcare providers trained in BLS and ACLS. So um, yes, we, we think we can transfer the data. So before we talk about advanced life support, I think it really is important to talk about how we as healthcare providers can prevent cardiac arrest. And so there's two kind of methods in the literature. So the first one, um, big in prevention, is rapid response teams. And it's unfortunate that 
the St. John Regional Hospital and Miramichi Hospital do not have rapid response teams. Moncton and Fredericton have a, sort of a modified rapid response team, but you can see that there's a 50% reduction in non-ICU arrests. And there's also a significant reduction in mortality for the post-operative patient. So rapid response teams do save lives. The other initiative that is recommended in the literature, and one of our units in the regional hospital has adopted this, is a modified early warning score. And so they call it a MUSE. And this is done on every patient, every shift by the nursing staff. And when your patient has a score of four or more, then there is actionable items that you have to manage. So uh, managing that patient is uh, a good preventative um, method for preventing cardiac arrest. So despite some of the processes that we have in place, we still do have cardiac arrest. And so the kind of cornerstone of good ACLS is good BLS. And so activating your code team immediately, initiating good, hard, and fast CPR, but not too hard and not too fast. So the average rate is 100 to 120. Um, Hands-only CPR has really been a game changer for both in hospital and out of hospital. And also attaching an AED as soon as possible. So the regional hospital has implemented an AED program and you will notice a number of AEDs strategically placed throughout our building. So here is the 2020 ACLS algorithm. Very robust evidence for hard and fast CPR. Kind of the benchmark to reach is getting early defibrillation to the patient within three minutes of recognition. And we actually do a pretty good job of that. You'll notice that in the 2020 guidelines, epinephrine got pushed down the algorithm and it is offered following a second shock. And it remains a class one uh, level B recommendation, which means there is some fairly robust evidence, but those in the resuscitation world kind of question that evidence. So published in 2018, the paramedic two trial took about 4, 000, or 8,000 patients in total, 4,000 randomized to saline, placebo, and 4,000 randomized to epinephrine. And yes, there was increased survival in the epinephrine group. However, there was significant neurological impairment in that group that survived. So I'm not sure too many people will thank us for saving them if they are not neurologically intact. So EPI has moved down in the shockable algorithm, but moved up in the PEA asystole arrest. And so the recommendations are, yes, EPI for cardiac arrest patients, moderately robust for the timing of one milligram every three to five minutes. Shockable rhythm, it has been ramped up in the algorithm. Talk about vasopressin, and vasopressin has been removed because it did not show superiority to epinephrine. And that might be something we need to talk about in a cardiac arrest uh, for post op cardiac surgery patients. And so maybe at the end of this discussion, we can talk about vasopressin and its uniqueness to cardiac surgery patients. There is no benefit anymore to the escalating or the high dose epi. There's also no evidence to support a practice um, that I hear happens in our province called dirty epi, 
I'm not really sure the origin of that name, but where you're putting epinephrine in an infusion and running it uh, wide open. So there is no evidence to support that practice. What there is, is evidence to support standardization and having um, processes in place. So we can't do a lot about our patient uh, comorbidities and that type of thing. But what really affects outcome uh, when you look at human performance is process and standardization. And that's what an ACLS course really highlights is a very methodical approach to resuscitation. And here is a template developed for an airway drawer. And if you go to the emergency department at the St. John Regional Hospital, you will see they have an airway cart that appears very much like this. And nothing else is allowed to be placed on top of this cart so that kind of your rote memory will allow you to pick up what is required for intubation and airway management. The things the algorithm doesn't touch on, and I think an ACLS course does a good job of, is talking about the divas, the people with the big egos that don't wanna park them at the door when they come into a resuscitation, or how we need to practice as a team. And I think that's really important. ACLS courses also talk about how to manage crowds and role identification. At the regional, we have implemented this kind of sticker system. And so we have a team lead sticker. So when more than one physician comes to a code, it's very difficult as a responder to identify who do I listen to? And so we've been instructed to put a lapel sticker on the team leader, and that is the only person we take medical orders from. Additionally, the defibrillator would wear a sticker, the airway manager, the medication RN. The only person in the six people who are required for resuscitation that doesn't get a sticker is the compressor. And that's because they need to rotate every two hours. Additionally, we need to do a better job of identifying our do not resuscitate patients. And so we are trying to trial uh, an armband method. And so hopefully in 2022, that comes to fruition within our um, health authority. Using a standardized reporting method, and I think this is very important, especially for the medical resident who is trying to manage a patient he or she may not know, but also have a team that he or she may not know. And so we have tried to use this method of uh, reporting using the word sample. So S standing for signs and symptoms that brought on the arrest, A for allergies, M for medication, P past medical history, last meal ingested for intubation, and then the events that brought this patient to the hospital. Other facilities prefer S bar, but this is what the medical resident or the attending physician needs to know about the patient in order to provide good resuscitation care. So I think one of the biggest things we need to recognize is not everybody follows that cookie cutter, that assembly line method of resuscitation. And one of those populations that uh, really deviate from standard ACLS is the post-op cardiac surgery patient. And so there are consensus statements published by the um, Society of Thoracic Surgeons that look at how to manage this patient population uh, specifically. So 
Here is their algorithm. Um, the algorithm hasn't changed much over the past probably eight to 10 years. But what it looks at is assess your rhythm. So if you have a shockable rhythm in a monitored patient, so you're able to see your VTAC or your VFib that's um, VTAC that's pulseless, we don't initiate CPR immediately if you can get a shock into that patient within a minute. And the recommendation is stack shocks. So you'll remember years and years ago in a standard ACLS course that we did stack shocks. Amiodarone 300 by a central line. And there is great discussion about the dose of epinephrine because of the detrimental effects that occur when you get return of spontaneous circulation. It shows down here, do not give epinephrine unless a senior physician advises this. And so the recommendation is a much lower dose of epinephrine between 300 and 500 mics instead of that full one milligram. When we look at the asystolic or bradycardic patient, um, our patients have uh, epicardial pacing wires. So we immediately attach the wires and see if we can get um, a good pulse with pacing. The important thing to remember is when you arrive at a code for a patient who is a cardiac surgery, uh, uh, cardiac arrest, the nurse may be initiating pacing, and this might be something quite foreign to the medical resident. And so I think it's important to kind of talk about during an ACLS course, these unique patient populations. And so you don't have to know a lot about pacemakers to be able to initiate pacing in an asystolic or severe bradycardic patient. You have a red button, DOO, it comes on in the asynchronous mode. We connect our ventricular wires. And uh, this is usually very successful, especially in patients who have had uh, valvular work in the OR because we know that that edema of the conduction system is the cause for the arrest. The important thing to talk about and something that we need to have a good discussion about is re-sternotomy at the bedside. And so the recommendation is that if your patient is less than 10 days post-op, that we should probably be looking at a re-sternotomy at the bedside. And so I think Dr. White has quite an interest in discussing that. So what affects our patient's outcome the most? So 2020 data from American Heart suggests that the two most powerful actions that an organization can undertake to improve output is debriefing and multidisciplinary simulation. And I think this really has been heightened in the era of COVID and a protected code blue. So debriefing. You can have two types of debriefing, a hot and a cold. So a hot debriefing occurs immediately after the arrest. And it identifies, oh, wow, what happened here? What did we do well? So make sure that you celebrate what you've done well. The only downside of a hot debriefing is sometimes the emotion is very raw. And if the code did not go well, sometimes it's not a great learning opportunity. A cold debriefing gives people time to kind of reflect upon what has happened and try and process how could we have done better. And so debriefing is very important. And I think we've started to recognize that and do a little better job of that at our facility in St. John. When we talk about the second thing, simulation, simulation is hugely important. And so when, when you do a, a quick literature search, you know, you get close to 20,000 hits in PubMed about 
simulation in healthcare. And so simulation for um, 911 dispatchers is, is really quite um, robust. If you look at cardiac surgery, it's robust. Even in non-healthcare providers, so in kinesiology courses and, and uh, um, athletes, very important. And then in the era of protected code blues and COVID and pandemics, it's really been uh, highlighted. So whether it's high fidelity or low fidelity, um, Simulation has a really significant impact on patient outcome. It also has an impact on staff morale, job satisfaction. It reduces burnout and enhances retention. And so the only downside to simulation is really the manpower to provide and the cost of simulation. So, um, Sora Blutch Medial and I were in the process of looking at simulation equipment for our heart center. And Sora very much wanted this guy. So this is Simman Vascular. And so I'm just going to sneak through this to the very end where you can actually take Simman vascular to the cath lab. Sorry. So Sorab and I were in the process of um, investigating that uh, very, very costly. Um, anyway, I think it's something that uh, warrants some investigation. So in summary, our patient variables are the most important when it comes to outcome. However, human performance is the biggest indicator of of a, a cardiac arrest done well. So debriefing identifies the issues and builds the trust by removing a perceived hierarchy. And there is no hierarchy in a resuscitation. And simulation really takes those issues that is, uh, are identified in debriefing and provides a judgment-free environment to build your team. So I will end there and have some um, discussion. Wonderful, Sue. Thank you so much for taking us through this and uh, invaluable information. Uh, and and uh, I'll, I'll start with the, the simulation because I, I really think uh, the decision we made in, in cardiac surgery for us this year was to include it as part of our round. So you might've noticed some weeks we don't have rounds on Zoom like this. The reason for that is that we actually plan simulation. So we've started in the intensive care unit with us in our chest reopening uh, approach. And our next goal, hopefully in a few weeks from now is gonna be to simulate cardiac arrest and the cardiac surgery patient on 5B North, and then move to the cat lab for our ECMO simulation and uh, CCU also. So our plan is to do it once a month. And maybe I'd encourage everyone who's on this call here that if you plan to sort of uh, listen to these rounds on a, on a weekly basis. Maybe that's the cue for you guys to think about in your institution, something that you could do for 30 minutes to try to stimulate that aspect. Um, and uh, maybe you can answer on the simulation, the, the difficulty. So when we did the first one in the intensive care unit, it's interesting how, I mean, we want, it's, it's sort of low fidelity. We didn't have a mannequin. We really wanted just to go through the process of people seeing how do we open something here, are the instruments here, you know, that was the first level. And our thoughts were the second time we would do it, we would do actually clinical scenarios because the first time was really just to get 
people around and it was relatively dry and i'm sure chris and i both felt like oh my god was this helpful or not i think it was but but you know people are just watching and they're not asking questions they're not really that engaged so anyways your thoughts on that well you can make any low fidelity interactive um so for 35 dollars, i purchased a simulation program that allows me to simulate pacing, simulate any rhythm. Um, it can give me a 12 lead. It can give me a chest X-ray. I can pace the guy, I can defibrillate him. And so you just build upon that. So if you have somebody who is good at coming up with clinical scenarios and anybody who's worked can pretty much do that, just draw from your experience. But I think the key is being inclusive and making it a judgment free. And like everything in my life, it has to be fun or nobody wants to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. How do you sort of navigate around people who are busy at work? And, you know, we did it in, you know, in the intensive care, we did it in the space. And, you know, nursing staff are busy doing their thing. It's kind of hard for most of them to say, okay, I'm going to take. 30 minutes of my time and not care for my patient and go and do this. So thank you for bringing that up because I think we need management support of this. And so if we're gonna plan SIM, then bring a nurse in who can help manage the patients in the ICU and say, today you're gonna go to SIM and Sally's gonna watch your patient. So I, I think we need to increase the um, importance of it and help administration understand that these are dollars well spent. So maybe my last question is around the, the rapid response team. So uh, I was curious about, I mean, so maybe we're thinking of it too big at the hearts at the uh, at the St. John Regional. Maybe there is an opportunity for us to think of it just heart center centric rapid response team. You know, would that be something possible? Anyways, just something to, to sort of yeah. I'm struck on how potentially valuable uh, and, and the impact on outcome that is. Um, you know that I mean these are not negligible statistics that you sort of pointed out on how a rapid response team would be helpful and you know we are the heart center for the province we should have a system not not that people are not doing their best at the moment but you know these uh, these muse score and sort of risk score to assess patient to you know I need some help here are pretty useful uh, and you know I would love to initiate something along those lines to think about. Well, a mu score is really easy to implement. It's uh, it's basically our nursing assessment, but a little bit more formalized process. Wow, excellent. Yeah. Well, unless there's any questions from the audience, uh, this closes our thirty minutes, and uh, and this will the recording will be posted as soon as uh, as I'm, I figure out how to put them on on uh, on YouTube, I still haven't done that. Anyways, thank you very much. These rounds are recorded and are visual possible to visualize them after. We do have a, a Heart Center web uh, YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Again, that was wonderful. Great.